for listen. He talked to St. Mary and the disciples too. He told them that his mission in this world was true. He ascended up to heaven to be by his father's side. And the man was just standing there with tears in their eyes. They said, I never. Do you know that man? Yeah. Lord, I never. Oh, can open any door. He can save. He can hit. Is it peace, peace, tail? Oh, Lord, no, no, I never. Oh, no. No, no. I never, never, never. Like Jesus before. Can I get one with this this morning, y'all? That's not like him, dog. Like Jesus before. I never, never. Oh, no, I never. No, no, Lord. Not my daddy, nobody but Jesus. Oh, like Jesus before. They hung him on the cross one day, y'all. And they laid him in the grave. The angel came from heaven, yeah. Roll the stone away, yeah. He sent it up to the Father, yeah. Yes, he to be by his Father's side. I never, never. I know. I never. No, I didn't, y'all. He's the best thing ever happened to me, y'all. I never met a man like Jesus. If you need a doctor, yeah. If you need a friend, yeah. If you need, if you need someone, y'all, to walk by your side, yeah. I never, 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 never. Oh, no, no, I didn't. I never, 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 y'all. Oh, Lord, like Jesus before. Oh, Lord, like Jesus. Oh, there's none, there's none, there's none, there's none, there's none like Jesus. I never met a man like Jesus before. personality of Reverend Woodson, Jeff Woodson, would you come and lead us to the throne of grace? We ask that you would give us our altar prayer, and if you'd like to come now, y'all can come to the altar. Pastor, would you come? And this is our good friend, Reverend Jeff Woodson. Amen. Anybody would like to come, just come. There is room at the cross for everyone. There's nobody like Jesus. He's able to do 
what no man can do. Father God, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God, we come before your presence today because we love you. God, we want to say that there's no one like you. We fail, God, in a lot of areas of our lives. But God, as we ask you this morning to forgive us for the things that we've done that wasn't pleasing in your sight. God, we know that you're able to do anything but fail. So look at us, God. Look at us right now in the name of Jesus. Heal us where we need to be healed. God, move on our hearts where our hearts need to be moved on. Mercy, God, because mercy soothes our case, God. Please, sir, as we come around your altar this morning, God, there's someone here today that needs you right now, God. Someone is looking for a job, God, and can't find a job. Someone, God, is just looking for that family healing, God, that needs you to heal the family right now, God. We ask you right now to please, sir, have mercy. There's somebody, there's somebody here, God, that is confused in mind, God. There's somebody's heart that is heavy right now, God. Uh, we know that you're able, God. So we ask you that you will. Please have mercy right now. God, there's nothing that you can't do, God. So we ask you, God, to move right now. Move like you never moved before, God. We ask you to stretch out your hand, God, and touch where men need to be touched, God. We ask you right now that you would look around the altar. God, wherever there is one that feels like they you don't have hope, God, that hope can exist through you, God. Please, God, save right now. If there's any around, around the altar that need to be saved, Oh, how we love you, God. We express, God, how we know, God, that there's nobody like you, God. But, Lord God, there's sometimes, God, that we find ourselves confused, God. Please, sir, have mercy right now. Bless this church. Bless the Good Shepherd Church. God bless the, the man that leads this church. Bless Pastor Skinner. And all the staff that makes up this church, have mercy right now. We thank you, God, for the opportunity of just expressing ourselves this morning. It's not the first time you heard from me this morning, God, but we thank you for the opportunity, God. We bless your name today. Bless the man that's going to break the word. Have mercy upon him. Now, thank you. Thank you, God, for another beautiful day. We ask you, God, to grant us what we need. It's in Jesus' name. We pray this morning. Amen. said, Amen. It's so good to be found back in the house of God one more time. Because we realize that he didn't have to do it. But he did. So we are forever grateful. I want to take this time to thank Dr. Skinner publicly for this opportunity, to those of you who are assembled, to other ministers, preachers, friends, 
family who are here visiting with us, thank you. I want to say also to the church, thank you for the women who came out in a public way to share with my mother and visit with her. I really appreciate it. Thank you for that. Thank you for those of you who continue to communicate with her and those for you that continue to pray for her. But I can hear her saying right now, speak well. So this morning, I'd like to call your attention to the book of Exodus. The book of Exodus. The 14th chapter of the book of Exodus. journey with the children of Israel who had to learn some lessons just as we do from a great God. It's 31 verses in there. We want to we want to lift our premise passages out and uh, I'll give you the outline for all that's there. And we're coming from verses 13 to 16. If you're there, just say amen. amen. And it says, And Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. The Lord will fight for you and you shall hold your peace. And the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward, but lift up your rod and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. For a subject we'd like to share this morning when God, what God brings you to, he can bring you through. <laughs> Subtopic, hold on to your belief in God. What God brings you to, he can bring you through. Hold on to your belief in God. It's a little illustration here that I'd like to share with a little girl. It says, the belief of a little girl. A little girl was talking to her teacher about whales, and the teacher said it was physically impossible for a whale to swallow a human because even though they were very large mammals, their throat was very small. The little girl stated that Jonah was swallowed by a whale. The teacher reiterated that whole whale could not swallow a human. It was impossible. The little girl said, when I get to heaven, I will ask Jonah. The teacher asked, what if Jonah went to hell? The little girl replied, then you ask him. <laughs> Hold on to your belief. What God brings you to, he can bring you through. This text has everything to do with a portrait of our deliverance that God brings the people that he chose back when he told Abraham in the 15th chapter of Genesis he reminded him that he was going to raise up a nation through him and they were going to go into bondage and be in captivity and when he said that he had already, God had already predestined these things to take place. And the thing I'm learning many times when it comes to God, and we get upset about the avenues of life and the ways and the turns that we take, but some things are already laid out by God behind the scenes in our lives. So if we want to blame anybody, we can blame him. Because he's behind the scenes 
in our lives. But whatever he does is for our best interest. A little background, Joseph now who has died and who has requested that his bones be brought over into Egypt and we see a picture of how even Jesus in his redemptive act being the Passover lamb who takes away the sins of the world. But in, his, in this text, in, 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 through this, we see a series of things that have to take place. God has a king that has been rose up in chapter 1 and said that knew not God. And Joseph says, now I'm off the scene. Now you got somebody else coming on. So God raises up Moses, who he has to spend some time with him 40 years in the desert. Then he takes him back another 40 years. And so when he comes to get ready to lead the children of Israel, Moses is about 80 years old. So he's an older man now who has spent some time with God, understanding some of the things of God as God is leading him through the wilderness with these people. He spent some time in the king's palace. So he knew the Egyptian ways. He knew the things that they wanted to be done and how they wanted it to be done. So he was familiar with both sides. And so in, the, in light of him now being the one that's leading them, God constantly uses the language of hardening Pharaoh's heart. And another way of looking at that is that he has made him, in other words, he is already evil. He was already stubborn at heart. It's, it's kind of like this. When a person is already evil and stubborn hearted, we think that some things that go on or take place, we, we, we look at it from the standpoint, if God is trying to bring them out, trying to deliver them, or save them, he has a way of doing it even though circumstance don't be favorable with them, but he can still change their mind through the process of what, however he chooses to do it. He could do it. Even though your heart, because Pharaoh was already hard-hearted. God just did a series of things, what we call the ten plagues, that was trying to add to how his heart was already hard. And so even he said to Moses, he said, I'm going to do these things to harden his heart. But at a point, he's going to let my people go. Because he told them to go back. And this is a significant stuff. This is a significant stuff. God wanted them to understand that I'm the only true God. Because this Pharaoh was acting as his own God among the people. But God is the only true God among his people. And so in light of that, he gives the instruction to Moses and Aaron. He said, now I want you to go and let him know that I need him to let my people go. Moses said, well, who am I going to tell him to come? That's going to do it. He said, tell him I am, I am that I am. I am. Sent you to tell him. And so as I fast forward through the process, we see that they had to make some preparation. We see where they had to go through the Passover, where we see that night where God had given instructions to Moses, telling him to put the blood over the lentils of the doorposts. And he says, wherever there's blood, he said the fact that the, the deaf angel is going to pass over Amen. that house Amen. when he sees the blood. Amen. And can I give you a snapshot? When Jesus covers you yeah. with his blood, yeah. the deaf angel can't do nothing to you. Yeah. Because even if he come, he's going to pass over yeah. because of the blood yeah. that we are covered. Uh -huh. And so when the doorpost is the deaf angel when he came because God had a plan yeah. in place. To, let his, to make sure that his people be let go. And in the process of this, he, they made the preparations. They got the stuff they got. When, when, the, when the deaf angel came and he killed all the firstborn, male and male of the animals. But it affected Pharaoh because of the fact it was his son that died. And I don't know about you, but I know when you lose a child, it can affect you. Knows how to stir the ways of life. 
to get our get us to moving in the right way. Yeah. Doing the things that he wants us to do. Yeah. So he knows what he's what he's doing and what he does. Yeah. So in light of that, we see that they made preparation thoroughly for the battle. He gave them everything they needed. But around the 17th verse in the 13th chapter, he says, now when you get ready to take them, I want you to detour. Because this is the question that came up. He says, let them go, but where were they going? Just in study. To a desert place. Now they had the conveniences, even being in bondage, under Pharaoh. They still had some conveniences there that they could have still ate, had a place to lay down. They still had the conveniences, but God called them out of convenience to inconvenience. Oh, you don't see what I'm saying? Sometimes he'll lead that way because we get so comfortable with this life and the things of this life. I heard Dr. Tony Evans say the other day, sometimes the problem is we, we not in love with eternal life, we in love with life. And it's this life that we want to hold on to. And so God sometimes has to move some of your comforts to make you uncomfortable in order to get you in the position he wants you to be in. So he said, take them through and detour. Because I don't want the people to get weary along the way. They might get in. There was other nations among them. So there were other things going on around them. He didn't want them to get weary along the way and have to do some fighting along the way. He said, take them another way. And so it brings us to the 14th chapter. We can bring it through. Hold on to your belief. Kind of outlining this particular chapter, I had seven areas that I looked at in outlining this chapter. One being the people of God, verses one through three. The plan of God, three through four. The pursuit of the enemy, five through ten. People complain to Moses, eleven through fourteen. The provision of God, verses fifteen to eighteen. And then the protection of God, verses 19 to 23. But lastly, the seventh thing, the power of God, 24 to 31. But God always knows what it takes to get our attention. Even when our intentions are not good. The tenth plague, the dying of all the firstborn male, even of the male animals, was what we would use the language, the straw that broke the camel's back. It got Pharaoh's attention. And now these people are out in a desert place. And now they're saying to Moses, you brought us out here to die? We would rather have stayed back there with Pharaoh enslaved and had to build brick, make bricks with no straw and then go through the suffering that we had to go through then to get out here and we ain't got nothing. But God is strange like that sometimes. That he'll lead you in a way that you wonder why I'm going this way. Why is he doing it like this? Let me, let me, let me help you, let me help you. In my, in my, in my life, I've been on a job for going on 13 years. A year ago, the man said, you stole 20 minutes on lunch break. After 13 years? Went through everything I could to try to fight the process. Got me a some consultation from a lawyer. Uh, went to HR and all this. None of that worked. Still looking in between for jobs. Then I get on at a company last year in June. Think things going all right. I'm like, okay, I kind of got things back on the order. You know, I can, I can tithe, I can give, I can do. Okay, I'm back on my job. Worked about to January. 
Say it had been slow. Let about six of us go. Lay me off. I say, no. You got me to jump up. All my stuff was all right. Why? I get laid off. So I'm laid off now. Resources getting funny. Uh, tight at the first of the month. But I'm still maintaining. God is still providing. I'm learning that you can live with less through the process of trusting God. I don't necessarily have to have direct TV. I'm not knocking you if you do. Keep paying for it. I'm just saying me. I can learn to live with less through the process of trusting God. But I'm still in this Mindset, okay. So I get another job. The man said, hey, I want to recommend you somewhere. And as soon as the opportunity takes place to get you back over here, I'm going to do that. So I go to another company, kind of like Pharaoh. Got other friends of mine here, brothers here that I talked to. They like, man, yesterday you complaining, man. He just like something ain't right about that. This man's like a taskmaster. Making bricks with no straw. I'm like, man, gotta find my, the, the the equipment to work with. Don't they don't have, they ain't providing it like that. It's out there. You just go get it. But you just working. You coming in every day. You know, have you? I'm I'm like I'm a type person. I like uniforms, but I don't like to wear my own clothes. So I gotta have a half uniform. And I'm like this preacher. This thing. I'm saying, Lord, this thing just ain't looking good to me. This picture, I, I see. I see you got me on another job. I, I, I thank you for that, but this thing ain't looking right. Four hundred thirty years they were there in bondage until God said it's time. About four and a half months for me there, but this is how God operates. Because one thing He helped me understand: stop complaining. Stop complaining. I got you. Right where you are. But don't complain. You complaining about everything. I, I even had to go in there and talk to Pharaoh. I said, hey, man, you messing with my money. Three, two and three days, I can't, I can't make it like this. Then one day I go in there and I tell him, I say, hey, man, well, what he made a statement. I said, well, that's a lie. The man said, T give him three more days out. I say, huh? Whoa. Yeah, when you come, if you, you want to work, I tell you what, he said, when you come back Monday, check with me and I'm going to see if you still want to work here. What? Tell you what, God. <laughs> Humility. When I came back that Monday, they, both him and the assistant in the office, they waiting on me. The other guy, they act like he God. They so scared. They, hey, man, I ain't even hit the clock. They say, hey, man, he want to see you. He want to see you. I go in there. Uh, well, we want to pick up where we left off. I was like, okay. Uh, you still want to work here? And God knows I wanted to say no. <laughs> so bad. But when I think about what I got to do, the sacrifices I got to make, I just couldn't do it. At that moment, he humbled me. He said, I said, yes, sir, I still want to work here. He said, okay, we got that out the way. Now let's proceed on. And we went through the process. And even the fact of me saying a lie was the truth. He was wrong. He just didn't want to admit it. But he told me, don't call it a lie. Call it a mistake. People make mistakes in the corporate world. They don't lie. One of the guys that worked there, he's a preacher too. He, matter of fact, he was the guy I rode with on my training day. And he said, uh, he said hey, Rev, let me, let me share something with you, man. He said, I know we can use that at the church by lying. He said, you got to be careful out here. I said, well, but I got it. But the truth is the truth, but the lie is a lie with me. But I understood where he was coming from because of their language, not always the language that we use because they got their own way of using their language in the corporate world because they don't want you to point nobody out and single nobody out. They want to act like it was just a mistake. It was some weird accident. So I said, okay. So in the end of the conversation, the assistant terminal manager he said, uh, well, you know, uh, 
We gave you a job when you needed a job. And I'm saying to myself, I didn't come here asking. I was, I was actually, somebody referred me to come here. I didn't come here begging for it. But I sit there still and I, I said, I appreciate it. Thank you. But look at God. In that four months span, every time they were trying to call me to come in at a certain time, the guy had started calling me. One Monday, I was at home, and the guy called me from the job I'm at now that I got back to. He said, hey, man, you at home? I was like, yes, sir. On a Monday? I was like, yes, sir. He said, I'll tell you what. I, I got the opportunity for you to be able to come back. He said, uh, but uh, give me a couple of days, and I'm going to call you back. And we'll work this out. I said, okay. They brought me back, me and another young man, as a rehire. Through the process of me trying not to complain, I was exalting God before this other young man who's really not a believer of God, who yoked up with me because we was in the same shoes together. And his language, I watched it start changing and start talking about, man, God is good. God doing this and God doing that. And God, I, I, I said, Lord, Thank you. And in the process of that, the man kept, when he let us know we would come back, they gave us time back. Gave us money back. Gave my benefits back. I said, God, go make, I can keep going. <laughs> gave it back. And put me in a position to where I can give like I need to give. Have my resources to pay what I need to pay. Dude, I had to go through what I had to go through to get to the other side. But God know how to take you through what you got to go through. And in light of that, when we got back, one day they called us. They said, hey, we need you to come in at this time. And the guy had called me. He said, hey, can you come now? I need you to do a drug screen. I said, uh, they, they called right back. They said, hey, don't come back later. Come in later. I said, man, look at God. That was right on time. Because I needed to go take that drug screen so I could go ahead on and get in there back where I was at. And when all that took place, and I came in there the last day and I gave the man my letter of resignation that morning. At 5 o'clock in the morning, I asked God, I said, let him be there, please. Let him be there. <laughs> and God let him be there. I went in the office. I told him, I said, I appreciate everything. I thank you so much. I said, but I'm going to be moving on. This is my two-week note. Before... I could get the other bills. He said what he had to say. I walked out. Before I could get the other bills and leave, we got ready to go get in the truck. I saw my friend coming back toward the yard. I'm thinking, what is he doing? He's supposed to be leaving. The man had came out there and told us, get out of my truck. You no longer work here no more. You got your two weeks. It's okay. You can go ahead on and go. All that. And then, and then I, started, I, I thought about it like some of my other trucking friends said. They said, well, you know what? I left the truck right there. But I didn't do that because I'm looking at God. I put the truck back, parked it, got out, went on and got my stuff. Me and the young man, we walked on out. There was rumors that the man followed us and did this. I said, ain't nobody following. He didn't follow me. He didn't bother me. I'm on the Lord's side. <laughs> the Lord had me. So he didn't bother me. He went on about his business. But I've heard rumors about what he does. But he didn't bother me. He went on about his business, and I went on about my business. That's, that was a Wednesday. That week, I, we, went, we went and sat down. We went, and, we went and got us some breakfast, and we waited, and we called the job we had now. And the gentleman said, hey, man, I had y'all down for two weeks ago. But he said, but I tell you what, I'll call you back in a few minutes. We started on that Friday. Because the week begins, he said, I want you to get a full paycheck. Now, you don't hear what I'm saying. Let me, let, me, let, me get ready. Let, me, let me get ready to get out of the way. What God brings you to, he can bring you through. So hold on till you believe. So when we, like the children of Israel, experience unfavorable situations, according to this text, how should we respond? 13th verse let me just start at 11, kind of for context. A matter of fact, the 10, he says, in the 14th chapter, it says, And when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. So they were afraid, and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. Then they said to Moses, Because we, there were no graves in Egypt, 
Have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you so dealt with us to bring us up out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we told you in Egypt saying, let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than we should die in the wilderness. 13th verse. What should we, how should we respond when our situations are unfavorable to us? Or, or we have been inconvenienced or things have changed? Number one, he says, don't fear. Moses said to the people, don't be afraid. Don't be fearful. Of what are you facing? We see the Israelites responding humanly. They were already fearful because they were out there, which is a human human attitude. It's, it's, it's okay. we, we do that. But he says, needs were met as slaves under oppression, but nothing, but, but out in the desert, nothing. But what did they have to have to do out there? God put you in a position to depend on him because that's where they were. With a back up against the wall situation. Where your dependence had to be on God. So don't fear is one of your responses. Or don't be afraid. But he says stand still. Stand firm, some version might say. Stand strong, some might say. Now I struggled with this, Pastor Skinner. I had to, had to really look into this. And another way of looking at it from the 46 46. Psalms, 46 number Psalms. Also the same word, because it's in, this, it's in the 14th version, it says be still in, in some versions. But this still is not saying that Moses told him just stand still. Don't do nothing. Not that kind of still. Stand firm. Stand strong. Not doing nothing, Israel must keep marching while believing God. Doing something. Good example of that. I was talking to a friend of mine. Uh, he had come out the world now, and he's in the church. And, uh, he's trying to get his life on track. He went through some uh, deaths in his family and all that. And uh, he was calling me up, and he was asking me stuff, and he was saying something about a job and all that. You know. And a lot of times, sometimes people, they feel like I get in trouble with them when I use it. When they say, well, you know, I'm just going to let the Lord handle it. I say, well, because I asked him, how many applications have you started filling out? He's like, well, I hadn't even did it. He said, man, I'm just praying. I'm just going to let the Lord handle it. I say, well, Jesus don't need no job. He ain't got to fill out no application. You got to fill out some application. And then trust Jesus. He, he said, man, you, you always got something to say, man. <laughs> but the point I'm saying is stand still, stand strong, stand firm. You still got to be doing something. Still, Israel, keep marching. Because we're going to cross. But let's trust the God that's going to take us to the other side to get us to the other side. So don't stand still don't mean just don't do nothing at all. Because that's why you'll still be at home and saying somebody probably going to call me. For what? Let me get out your way. Stand still and see, look, pay attention to the salvation or deliverance, which is God's help that he's going to give you. So whenever you are going through unfavorable situations or whatever the circumstance may be, he says, don't be afraid. Keep standing strong. And look and pay attention to what God will do. Four months. But I watched him in his own wise way bring you out. And so he says, the Lord, in verse 14, will fight for you. And you shall hold your peace. Some will say, be still, be quiet, be silent. But I, I looked at the NAS, NASB. It says, cease striving. Stop to not, don't panic in what the process. It's not just don't do nothing at all. When we're trying hard to fix something, God has already fought for you behind the scenes. You ever, you, ever, you ever been in a situation where you've been in a convenience store or whatever the situation be or, or whatever clothing, and the situation already pretty much in your favor and it's fixed, but you want to say something because you know you're right. And God is saying, just be quiet. 
You ever see that with Judge Judy? She be, uh uh uh, you, you already winning the case. Now you finna lose it, cause you talking. So at times we just have to find ourselves being quiet, ceasing or stop, but don't panic in the process when God is fighting for you, cause he already won the battle. But we still got to put our little two cents in. God don't need my help. He can do it all on his own without my help. The psalmist was saying, 46 and 10, be still and know that I am who? God. And then Moses, God has the instructed. He wanted to pray and he said you need to do something. Look at it in the text. The Lord, in 15, he said, the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward. Yeah. Ain't no sense of talking to me yeah. right now, Moses. Yeah. And sometimes we find ourselves when we need, when we want to pray about it, we could be doing something about it. He said, tell them to go ahead on and move forward. He says, and I think about this, <laughs> this last part, I'm going to put the mules in the barn right here. It's the cowboy church, that's what the pastor says over there. <laughs> he says, but lift up, in verse 16, but lift up your rod and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. Right here he says, Moses already had what he needed in his possession. I think about my neighbor, my neighbor, my neighbor. They were outside. Uh, it's a family still across the street, and I think one of the little nieces or somebody, her car was, uh, they left the battery on, light on or something in the car. So they came and asked me, can you give me a boost? I said, okay. So I go over there and try to give them a boost. Got it crumped up one time, and then it went out, and it wouldn't start back up again. And then they went in the house, and then the car didn't have no power, so they couldn't even get back in the car. So I thought about it, and I came outside, and the young lady started saying, well, you know, I got AAA, and I got this, and I got that. I said, you know, you already got what you need. Because she was saying that the devil must be against me. The devil must be on my, I can't, none of it. I said, well, why are we blaming it on the devil? If your battery bad. <laughs> Batteries go out. But we don't need to blame it on the devil. But I said, but now look at what you have resource-wise to use to help you in your situation. She said, I got AAA the next day. I didn't see the car. Use what you have. You got it in your hand, Moses. Hold it out. And the sea began to congeal. Now, there's some, some theological base about whether or not this was the miracle, or how the water went and all that. All I know that I believe what, the God, what God says. That the children of Israel went across on dry ground. All night of the east wind, the Bible says, dried up the bottom of the sea. And the waters congealed and stacked themselves up like ladders. And the children of Israel were able to go across on dry ground to the other side. And since God has a covenant keeping God and he can't lie, the thing he told them was going to happen, it very happened. That here, comes, here, come, here come the enemy trying to come now. Pharaoh and his, and his troops coming. Now they get in there and God closes up the sea. And that's like he told them, those that you see, the Egyptians you see, you'll never see them again. Because even the Bible says some of them washed up on the shore just to let you know that I'm the covenant-keeping God, the one that's got to keep his promise to you. Because in this story, it's about redemption. God calls you out to call you in. I, I just, it, Exodus means the going out. And I don't know about you, but one day I was out. But God called me in. And that's what Jesus did for us. He died. I didn't want to go there. But I'm pretty good right now. He died on a Friday. He died on a Friday. They hung him high, stretched him wide, and dropped him low. On a Friday evening, they took him down, put him in a bar or two, stayed there all night, Friday night, all day, Saturday. But you know, you know the story. It was early, early, early. Sunday morning, Jesus got up with all power, all power, all power in heaven.
heaven and earth in his hands. And you in the know, ain't he all right? Ain't he all right? Did he call you out to call you in? He's a good God. He's a good God. Yeah. That's very little doubt in our mind that you bring us to so that you might bring us through. But you told us we can't be fearful. We have to be firm. And then, Lord, we just got to watch you finish your work because you know how to do what you do. So, Lord, we thank you for reminding us no matter what you bring us through, no matter what the trial may be, no matter what the test may be, you have the power to bring us through. Somebody needs to know that this morning, God. That's, that's somebody struggling in this building right now to know that you can bring us to situations so that you can bring us through situations. Sometimes you got to bring us to pride. You got to bring us to humility so we can work through pride. You, you got to bring us through the tough times so that you can bring us to a point of victory. So God, thank you for reminding us that with you there is nothing impossible. Lord, life does get rough. It does get tough. People make it rough, problems make it rough, but we are convinced that there is no problem with people or with situations that you cannot handle. So thank you for using Ramel Ellison to remind us of that reality this morning. We give you the honor, we give you the glory, and we give you the praise. God, we pray now for some soul that may not know you, still in the guilt of their sin. But through the message today, hearing about the redemptive work of God, that they might come to trust Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. To you, Lord, we give the honor, the glory, and the praise. We ask again that you would open hearts as only you can. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen going to ask those our servant leaders that can come comfortably brothers if you can without disturbing anyone very much thank you so much thank you so much maybe someone today needs to respond to the message that you've heard today that God has allowed you this opportunity to be where you are in this place today to know that there's something he wants to bring you to so that he can bring you through he wants to bring you to Jesus so that he can bring you through this life that he has given you. And it's only when you come to Jesus that you're able to go through life the way he's designed for you to go through. But it starts with knowing three things about Jesus, that he died, 
that he was buried and that God raised him from the dead. And foundationally, that is the gospel message that God would have you, all of us to believe in order that we might have eternal life. Someone may say, someone may say, um, well, when I get myself together, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll do that very thing. But I want to let you know today, no matter who you are, you will never, ever get yourself together. Because the reality is that all of us fall short of the glory of God. The Bible says that we're born in sin and we're shaped in iniquity. And you may ask the question, what is sin? Sin is rebellion against God. And so when we all come into the world, we all come with a slant. Not toward God, but a slant away from God. But here is the reality. God has given his perfect son who lived a perfect life who became an example for us on the kind of people that God ultimately would want us to be, but to help us to recognize that we cannot do it on our own. We need Jesus. The Bible says that God made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Isn't that amazing? The Bible is clearly showing us that God allowed his son who was sinless to be treated as a sinner like you and I, but on, in turn, God turned around and gave us the righteousness of Jesus Christ because he has forgiven us for our sins through his son, Jesus Christ. So today we celebrate that reality. So today, if you haven't known Jesus, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, you can today by believing that God gave his son to die for your sins, was buried in a grave, and that God raised him from the dead. No matter where you are, I'm going to ask you to stand where you are. Come if you choose. There, there's a, a, a space for you right in the front, front pew here. But just stand where you are. If you don't come, we'll come to you because we want you to know about Jesus. We want you to know about the one who saved us. We want you to know about the one who rescued us when we were in the pit of sin on our way to a condemning hell. But thank God for Jesus. Jesus forgave. God forgave us through Jesus Christ. And now we not only have his forgiveness, but we have also the promise of eternal life. That only comes through Jesus Christ. And so today, if you haven't trusted him, here is your opportunity. Stand where you are. Come if you choose. No matter who it may be, no matter what you have done, you qualify for the finished work of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary and the resurrection power that he demonstrated early Sunday morning. If you can believe that today, stand where you are. Come if you choose. Come on. Come on, come on, no matter who you are, come on. Perhaps you say, I am a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. But maybe you're in a transition time where you need to be in a church, where you're able to work out your salvation in fear and trembling. And if that describes you today, stand where you are, come if you choose. We would love again for you to be part of the Good Shepherd Church. Maybe God is leading you to some other church. We would be happy to direct you put to another church whereby Christ is the center of everything that they say and do. And so if that is you today, stand where you are. Come if you choose. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Right now. Today. Thank you again for reminding us 
that you bring us to, what you bring us through. So that at the end of the day, the glory is yours. The growth is ours. And we thank you for it all in Jesus' name. And all who agreed said amen. 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 Won't you give the Lord hand praise one more time for his goodness, his greatness, and his kindness toward us. We have, we have a, a, a child to be dedicated today. I'm going to ask you all to bring, bring the baby. Come on with, with us for the dedication.